Get me that signal. We need more power. Hello, Iron Dwarf Clan. This is Mortar of the newly. Oh, hey, hey, that won't go to Hello, Iron Dwarf Clan. This is Mortar of the newly established Zinc Dwarf Clan. Yes, most of the good metal names were already taken, so we are the Zinc Dwarves. Right now, it's just me and my wife. But we hope soon to expand our modest home with a pitter-patter of tiny feet. As you know, after a single growing season, dwarves reach their maturity, so we'll have some much-needed help and not just another mouth to feed. Which brings me to my point. Could you please refrain from using the baby-making cave this one season? As you know, once a dwarf goes there to have a baby, no other clans can use that cave until next season. We're getting a little desperate in our wish for children, and your clan has been hogging the love den every season. Did you tell him that we need the nookie cave? I, I just told I just told him. Now keep quiet until I finish my message. Marty, my biological clock is ticking. Tick, tick. Luckily, you've already deafened me, woman, so I can't hear it tick. Yes, I know that, Puddin'. Now let me finish, please. In order to repay you for your kindness, I'm willing to show you our plans for expansion and development so that you will soon see that the Zinc Clan will be providing for all of the Zinc needs throughout the Dwarfdom. We agree to give a 20% discount to the Iron Clan to cement our future friendship. Now, now let's take a look at the plan. I've got it here on the table. You can see for yourself that we're working to better our piece of the mountain for all of dwarf kind. It's over here. Here we have the whole game all set up. I just want to give you a quick tour of what's going on before we play through a turn so you can see how this thing works. Right here is our main boards. These are where all our main actions are. Now, as you can see, there are different now there are different boards depending on the number of players. It was all carefully crafted by Lookout Games, and then we also have these cards that get flipped up, and these kind of randomized things that come out. Like there's a stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four cards. And they're all in a stack, and they kind of get shuffled by stages. And so you're not exactly sure when sheep farming will come out, and and various things like that. Uh, on your home board, this is your little farm and your cave. This is where you build all your buildings, and this is where you do all your farming. Uh, you start out with two peoples, and over here are three more just waiting to be born, along with three stables that you can make. You can't go beyond that, because that's all you get. Over here is the most interesting part. Instead of cards, we now have these little tiles that you can purchase in order to expand your little mountain habitat. There are a lot of different ones. On here you can see it shows the cost. Like, for example, stone storage. That costs three wood and one ore and it will give you one victory point per stone that you have at the end of the game. And there are things for everything. I mean, look at all of these. This is the biggest uh, thing that slows down the game because you're trying to figure out which one of these you want to do. And there's so many choices. Of course, up here are the dwellings that you can buy so that you can get more dwarves out on the table in order to get more actions. Up above them, you have the food. There's your expedition tokens. We'll talk about those in a bit. There's money. There's things if you run out of tokens. Here are tiles that will help you build your civilization. And over here, we have a whole box full of different items 
What do we have? We've got wood. We've got stone. We've got vegetables. We've got wheat. Sheep. Bah. Cows. Wild boars. Donkeys. Doggies. What else? Oh, we have ore. We have rubies. And that's about all we have. There's a lot of stuff. This is probably the heaviest game in this size box that I've ever had. So it costs a lot to ship. But that is the board itself. Now let's see how we actually play this game. The object of the game is to score as many points as you can. And at the end of the game, which is after 12 rounds, you will go through this score sheet and add up all your points based on everything that you have, and the person with the highest amount of points wins the game. For example, let's see, per farm, farm animal, and dog, you get one point. For every missing type, you lose two points. You get half a point per grain, one point per vegetable, one point per ruby, one point per dwarf, negative one for each unused space, and then all of your tiles also have points on them. Well, not all of them, but all your furnished tiles. For example, this one has two victory points. Or, <laughs> or this ore mine gives you three victory points. Plus, a lot of the buildings give you bonus victory points. For example, this cooking cave here would give you two victory points at the end of the game just for having it. Every dwelling that you add so that you have room for more dwarves, well, this one will give you also three victory points at the end. So these buildings do make quite a difference at the end of the game. Now you have your basic actions, and then there's 12 rounds, and each round a new action is added. Here we're at the beginning of round three, and the, I know the board is set up for three players, and I only have two out, but I only have two board, room for two boards on my table. So this is just to show you how it works. The first thing you do at the beginning of a new round is you flip up the new card and put it in the right spot. Now at the end of this round, this little symbol indicates there will be a harvest, which means we're going to have to feed our people. So we got to make sure we have at least two food per dwarf. Everybody is still sitting at two dwarves at the moment. So each of them is going to need to have a total of four food in order to feed their dwarves, or they'll have to take begging tokens. Now this new card I just flip, flipped up is the new action that's available this round, and it's called Blacksmithing. We will take a look at that in a minute. And then you go through and you have to seed all of these spaces because something gets added on some of these every turn. So this one gets a stone. These two get an additional stone. And that's it. So that part is done. We put all of that down. Now we can actually go and take our actions. And this player, we'll call player one because they have the little starting player token. They're going to go first. So they look at their board and they're like, hmm, what do I want to do this turn? I don't know, really. And they decide to go for sustenance, which allows them to take these two food tokens that are built up. Now they have four. They get a new grain, which they put on the side. That can be sown later or used for food. And they get to slash and burn a new tile. Not slash and burn. They get to place one of these new tiles. So they place this on their own board right next to the existing one. They could place it here. They could place it here. If they place it here, they would get a free wild boar. Because they're covering that up. But they probably have to eat him because they don't really have any place to put him. I think the rules say you can't keep a wild boar in your house. I don't remember. So that's their first action. Now blue gets an action. Now 
What is Blue going to do? Blue decides he wants to go for ore mining. Which means he gets to take all five of these ore. Ha <laughs> ha, ore, it's mine. Let's over to Blue's board. And he would also get plus two ore for each ore mine that he has. But uh, he doesn't have any ore mines. So he doesn't get plus two. So it's back to the other guy's turn. What is he going to do? Well, he decides that it's his turn to get some sheep. So he's going to go sheep farming. Now, let's take a look at the sheep farming card a little closer. Okay, what this says is, if he has two wood, he can fence in one small pasture. If he has four wood, he can fence in a large one. If he has one stone, he can place a stable, and then he gets any sheep that have been accumulated on this card, which he has the choice of either eating them instantly, and converting them into food, or, and sheep are worth one food each, or if he has some place fenced in to put them, he can put them there and they can keep multiplying. So he does happen to have two. And he could do both of these if he wanted to, if he had enough wood to do it. Or he could do pick and choose, but only once time, one time for each action. So he's got the two wood. He's going to turn that in and get this little fence pasture. You see, this worth two victory points. So he's going to place it right here. Then he also has a stone. So he's going to use that stone and place his stable right there. That makes the capacity four animals now. He takes the three sheep he just got and puts them right there. There he goes. A little pasture now with three sheep. How's Blue going to top that? Well, let's just find out. Here is Blue's last turn. He decides he's going blacksmithing. Let's take a look at the blacksmithing card. This card allows you to convert 1 to 8 or into a weapon valued from 1 to 8, depending on how many ore you spend. And then go on a level 3 expedition. So, what this means is, he's got these 5 ore here. 1, 2, 3, 4. Five. Tosses them back in the box. Takes the level five marker and puts it on his guy. And now he gets to go on an expedition. Here is the expedition card. This is levels one through eight on the front and it goes up to 14 on the back. And he can take three items, because it's a level three expedition, from anywhere from five on up to the top. So the first thing he does is he's going to need some food. So he's going to take a vegetable. That'll give him two food at the end. But he can only take one of each thing that's on here. So that's one item. He's also going to take a little sheep which goes and lives with him and his wife in his beautiful dwelling, because you can have a pair of animals in there. So that's two items. He gets one more. What is he going to pick? Well, he wants to do some more sowing soon, so he's also going to take this grain. And there's his three items. He got that. He just got to pick them. Isn't that kind of cool? And now, since he's gone on the expedition, he instantly goes up to level six. So the next time he goes, he'll be able to go on a level six expedition. Now we're at the end of the round because we've done all our actions. The next thing that happens is, since we're at the end of the turn, there is a harvest at the end of this turn. And what does that mean? Well, the first thing that happens in a harvest is you get to bring in crops from the field. So any crop that has been sown, we take one off here, and we take one off here, and it goes back into your supply. The second thing that happens is you have to feed your people. And that's two food per dwarf. Well, this guy's got four food right here. So he feeds his people. 
Now this guy, he doesn't have any actual food, but he's got two vegetables. He's going to take these two vegetables and use that to pay for feeding his people, because you're each, each worth two food. And you don't have to, you know, you can do conversions right there on the spot. No problem. That's one of the things I really like about this game. For example, if you have rubies, rubies are special. There's a whole ruby chart for what you can buy using rubies. And you can do this at any time. So at any time, I could turn in one ruby and get a, a vegetable for it. And that would give me two food. Or I could convert one little box into a pasture or a, or a meadow, whatever it's called. And then convert this into a plowed field. Or add a tunnel system in one of my caves. That's all just for one ruby. Or you can play a dwarf out of order. Now you have to play your, you're supposed to play your dwarves in order of most powerful to least powerful. So on Blue's next turn, his level six weapon dwarf would have to go first. Unless he had a ruby that he could pay, then he could make his, let his other guy go first. It does make a difference sometimes. For one ruby plus one food, you can get a cow. That's kind of nice. There's no, ways to get a cow on here and so that's what rubies are useful for they come in pretty handy last thing is let me just point out one thing on the board there's this spot called imitation it costs four food to use it but it allows you to use an action space that has already been used so if you really really needed to do something on your turn you could get that four food, pay it, use this spot, and that lets you allow, allows you to use one of the other spaces' actions. Like if you really needed to expand your family this turn, you could have done that. Or go on that expedition you really needed, you could have done that because you use this imitation space, which is really nice. And this space here, the supply space, that gives you plus one of all these resources and plus two money which is kind of nice. Money is also worth victory points. And it can be converted to food as well. There's so many things in this game. It is a lot of fun. And I know it looks like a lot, and there is a lot to it. There's a lot to set up. There's a lot to tear it down. But I have so much fun playing it and learning how to play this game. And everybody I've taught has had a good time. Some people, it's too much. The analysis paralysis really boggles their mind. But you know, I guess that happens with any game. It just depends on what you think. And that's how you play Caverna. What a great game this is. If you like Agricola, 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 then you should enjoy Caverna too. No, I'm not a Viking, I'm a dwarf. There isn't as much pressure just to get your people fed. There are plenty of ways to generate food or get some at the last moment. Rubies are quite valuable as they allow you to trade them for valuable resources when you need them the most. Expeditions also allow you to get what you need. Some of them even allow you additional actions if you reach a high enough level. Each time you go on an expedition, your dwarf will go up a level so that on his next expedition he can get better stuff. The rules even tell you that if you allow a player to be the only one going on expeditions, then they will run away with the game. So you can't just ignore them. The building so these are the main ways players are able to differentiate their boards from other players' boards. Most of the buildings can only be built once, so that no other player can use their benefit. I still don't even know what all the different buildings do yet. There are a few negatives. I'd advise you to have the game set up and ready to go before the players get there. A setup does take a while, as does putting the game away. It isn't a short game either. Sure, it'll speed up after everyone gets familiar with it. The box says 30 minutes per player. I'd say more like 45. Your biggest enemy? Analysis paralysis. Yes, having a lot of buildings is great, but when you have a bunch of resources and got 30 buildings to pick from, it might take you some time to make up your mind. It's a great game because of all the different strategies you can employ, but it can also drive you crazy figuring out what you should do. Playing the solo game is a good way to get some practice in and allow you to develop some strategies along the way. 
The rules mention that breaking a score over 100 can be accomplished regularly by experienced players, but so far I haven't even come close. Speaking of the rules, they could have been a little better. The appendix is great as it lists every building tile and what it does, but the rulebook itself could have used some better organization. Clearly explaining every action space in alphabetical order would have been nice, and organizing the rules for easy location later would have been even nicer. It took me 10 minutes to figure out what the darn dog was used for, as it's just a side note on a graphic. I know I read somewhere in the rules that certain types of animals can't be kept in a cave dwelling with the dwarves, but I haven't been able to find the rule again. Let's clearly lay out what animals can go where and what they can do. Aside from those items, I really have enjoyed playing this game. Even people who didn't enjoy Agricola might take to Caverna. I know it sounds a lot more exciting than explaining, okay, in this game you're building a farm. That's Agricola, you know. So I might be able to get new players in with less effort. Yes, you're building a farm and you're fighting and going on expeditions and building a cave and eating donkeys. Well, that's about it. Time for me to get going. Where are you going? I'm going on an expedition, dear. Oh, no. You're going on an expedition right to the breakfast room to milk those cows. But, honey, all the other dwarves are going. Don't make me use my hammer. <sighs> Thanks for joining me in this review of Caverna from Lookout Games and the Mayfair Games. You know, the bottom, you know. Let me know if you found this review helpful by leaving a comment or send in me an email at Elliot underscore Miller at voiceofe.com. Make sure to subscribe to the Voice of E channel on YouTube, like the Voice of E on Facebook, and visit our website at www.voiceofe.com as I'll have plenty of gaming, entertainment, comic book coverage this year, and it should be a lot of fun. Don't forget Twitter. I like Twitter. Thanks again, and until next time, keep your mind free. Did you tell them that we need the nookie guy? Yeah, I'm done. I'm going to milk themselves, you know. I'm, yes, I'm bloody well done. Oh. <sighs>